Go the anticipation. Hello and welcome to Festival of Nature. I'm Emma Brisian and as someone who spends quite a lot of her weekends and evenings on a kayak in the River Avon, this afternoon I am delighted to be talking to George Clark, Project Manager at Bristol Avon Rivers Trust, to find out a little bit more about your work restoring and looking after and finding out more information about our rivers and what's going on in and around them around Bristol. So, George, hello, how are you doing? Hi Emma, yeah, I'm really well, thank you. Um, enjoying the Festival of Nature. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking to you all about our rivers um, and the work that we do um, on them. Yeah, brilliant. So, okay, first of all, let's start with a little bit of background then. Bristol Avon Rivers Trust, we can call it BART maybe from now on. Briefly, what kind of thing do you do? Who are you and what's your work involve? Yeah, well, um, yeah, as you say, Bristol Avon Rivers Trust, but um, yeah, you can call us BART. Um, we're an environmental charity that form part of the wider Rivers Trust uh, movement. Um, and we work to protect, enhance um, and restore the many rivers and streams across the Bristol Avon catchment. Um, and that catchment covers sort of South Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, North Somerset um, and the cities of Bristol and Bath um, and all the many waterways, um, rivers, streams um, that flow through that area. Um, and we do this by sort of working with communities um, and a wide variety of stakeholders to, to deliver projects that improve these habitats, um, enhance our local blue spaces um, and connect the communities uh, with their natural environment. Um, and overall, our kind of mission is to make these environments and make these waterways better places for, for people and for nature. So what, what kind of state are our rivers in, I guess, across the UK, but also more locally? How, how are our rivers faring at the moment? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, it's a big question, it's, sorry. It's, yeah, <laughs> a massive question. But um, I suppose going on, on the kind of um, official and, and latest data on river health released by the Environment Agency uh, last year, um, they showed that only 14% of English rivers are in a good ecological health or condition um, and that none of our waterways um, are in a good chemical condition. Um, which, yeah, sounds and is um, extremely concerning for, for the communities um, and for the wildlife that depend on these environments. Um, from a kind of local point of view, I think it's probably a similar picture, um, but the, the rivers and streams of the Bristol Avon catchment are, are very varied um, and they flow through rural and urban environments. So the kind of pressures that they face can come from a variety of sources. Um, but we're also lucky enough to have kind of beautiful streams and rivers uh, that flow through amazing environments, um, sort of areas of natural beauty like the Cotswolds um, and the Mendip Hills. Um, and these provide amazing habitats for wildlife, um, as well as being um, brilliant recreational opportunities or, or providing those opportunities. Um, but even those ones face pressures uh, which have an impact on, on river health, um, river water quality and biodiversity in these waterways so um yeah to answer your question um <laughs> not not a great state but um yeah lots of potential and lots of work to be done as well so you touched on a couple of them there maybe but what what is it that's causing the problems what what are those pressures that we're seeing send our rivers and our waterways into the the dark end of those statistics that you pointed out yeah again i mean really varied and, and complex reasons and, and issues um, ranging from pollution stemming from, from agriculture in our more rural environments um, to the pollution of our rivers uh, from towns and cities. Um, perhaps most notably and, and most um, newsworthy at the moment is pollution carried in, in sewage um, and um, combined sewer out, uh, overflows, um, taking sort of raw sewage into our, into our rivers, which is obviously not good news. Um, as well as pollution coming from like surface water, which, which leads from our roads in our urban areas. Um, there's also problems caused by sort of centuries of modifications and, and alterations of our water courses. Um, yeah, our rivers have been modified to power industry or feed farmland. Um, they've been moved and straightened and disconnected from their floodplains um, and therefore function a lot less naturally than, than they should perhaps. Um, and these have knock-on effects on the aquatic wildlife populations um, and the overall health of these environments. 
I mean, okay, well, why then perhaps should we care about the state of our rivers and our, and our waterways? Well, um, for, for loads of reasons, really. Um, you know, rivers play such a major um, and actually quite unforgotten role in shaping our landscapes, um, as well as connecting habitats. Um, and they support the communities that have developed alongside our rivers um, over you know, millennia, really. Um, but even, you know, really crucial for today. Um, you know, as people re rely on rivers um, as sources of drinking water, as sources of irrigation for farming, um, and also for the fun stuff as well, the kind of re recreational activities that we all like to do, such as kayaking, like you enjoy, um, fishing, um, and increasingly sort of wild swimming as well. Um, but away from the the people that you know that rely on on rivers and care about them um, our freshwater habitats are home to a diversity of species as well um, which are all crucial to a healthy ecosystem from aquatic plants and invertebrates uh, which form the basis of many food chains um, to the fish species that lie beneath as well um, and I think I touched on that as well rivers are you know, wildlife corridors which enable these species to move through the landscape between other habitats as well. Um, that's not just aquatic species, but also terrestrial and avian, spe avian species, posed like um, birds and bats. Um, so yeah, there are a few reasons why we should care about our rivers. Um, I think everyone has different, yeah, everyone probably has their own kind of interests and reason why they do care about them. But um, for a function, a, you know, naturally functioning <laughs> ecosystem, healthy rivers are really important. Okay, you've led us on really nicely there. Let's talk a little bit about wildlife. So if I can bring the conversation back to my kayak again, you're going to see a theme through this. Yeah. I went out at the weekend and I regularly see, you know, kingfishers, cormorants, herons. There's loads. They're humming with life. There's loads of um, damselflies and dragonflies and mayflies out at the moment. Yeah. But the water's pretty murky. And actually, the one thing that I don't know very much about is what life is actually in the water underneath the kayak or underneath my feet if I'm swimming. So... You know, what's going on below the surface, particularly in the Avon and, and around where we live? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, the Avon and, and all of its tributaries, its rivers and streams that connect to it, that flow into it, um, have a huge variety of life beneath the surface. Um, and this is the wildlife that's often kind of forgotten about because we don't see it as often as, like you say, the, the bird species or even the invertebrate life as well. Um, but if you do spend time on the riverbank at this time of year, you may notice um, mayfly hatches, like you touched upon, you know, these um, kind of dancing swarm of invertebrates, mm. which are key indicators of, of healthy watercourses. And look even closer or, you know, hone in on a mayfly as it touches down on, on the river surface. You might see a um, fish rise to, to the surface to snatch that mayfly uh, for its dinner as well. Um, so things like migratory fish, uh, such as brown trout or Atlantic salmon, live in the Avon. Um, you know, Atlantic salmon, which are you know, a really um, key um, species of conservation concern, um, are found on, on the rivers around Bristol um, and Bath and, and our catchment, which is really exciting. Um, and those fish migrate upstream to spawn in the headwaters. Um, we also get resident fish as well, um, the smaller fish such as bullheads, uh, gudgeon and roach, um, sticklebacks and minnows, all these sorts of amazing fish species um, that you know, most of us probably would never even see unless we fish or, um, mm. you know, spend a lot of time near the water. So it's really amazing to, to know that that's there. And lots of those species are obviously, you know, key, key species in the food chain as well. And, and other wildlife that you see, such as those kingfishers, um, rely on those um, fish populations uh, themselves. So um, yeah, t tons of stuff beneath the surface. Um, and all of your invertebrate species that you talked about there, your mayflies and dragonflies, spend the majority of their life cycles or majority of their lives um, as you know, unwinged aquatic insects, um, as larvae sort of clinging to rocks and um, hiding in the silt in our rivers um, before they become winged insects as well. So yeah, it's, uh, there's a whole variety of life beneath the surface that we, we never get to see, really. And it just makes it increasingly important to protect those, those environments. So how do you actually, how do you learn more about what species we've got on our waterways 
In fact, you you guys over at BART have got some really interesting new techniques, haven't you? You've been using something called eDNA analysis mm. to work out just what it is that we've got, which species we've got living in each different part of our river. So can you tell us a little bit more about your work with eDNA? Yeah, of course. And like I say, we, we do monitor our rivers and we, we try and find out what, what is lying beneath. We use the more traditional um, techniques. We've, we've used um, electrofishing surveys, um, as well as um, river fly monitoring as well, where you do, um, you're looking at the invertebrate populations. But some of these traditional techniques often miss a lot of the species that are there. And, you know, you have to be very lucky to actually find everything that's within a kind of stretch of river. Um, so we've been using this exciting pioneering um, technique called environmental DNA sampling or eDNA to try and gain a bit of a better understanding of the life found in our rivers. Um, which is really important, you know, understanding the fish is really important in terms of the way that they enrich our ecosystems, but also in our ability to kind of value and protect the natural world. If we're not aware of what's beneath that, um, you know, it, it's much harder to encourage and persuade people to, to act to um, kind of care for these environments. Um, but eDNA itself works by DNA sequencing. Of, of little biological fragments. So we take a really small sample of water from fixed points along the river. Um, and within that, we, we sort of force it through this um, filter, through a syringe. Um, and by um, DNA sequencing of this sample, um, we can get a really good indication of all of the organisms that were present in that sample of water or that have literally swum through that bit of water before. Um, Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. So it uses little fragments such as shells and scales within the water to actually try and indicate what, what species are there. Um, and it's, yeah, it, like I say, it, it kind of um, identifies the, organi the organisms that we do miss during the traditional survey methods. Um, and in the pilot project that we've just run on the River Chew in uh, south of Bristol um, in the Chew Valley, our eDNA sampling identified uh, 14 fish species um, and around 100 macro invertebrate species as well, wow. um, just from these really small samples of water. Um, so species such as three-spined stickleback um, and the European eel um, actually have been discovered um, through this sampling as well. And we're hoping to roll that technique out across the Bristol Avon catchment um, to help monitor um, and to target our future work as well. Fantastic. Well, I mean, gathering all of this data and getting really rigorous scientific data is so important for when it comes to shaping your work moving forward. Mm. So how do the results of all of your eDNA analysis actually feed into the work that BART does? Yeah, well, um, by providing that kind of scientific um, evidence base um, that we need to take work forward and that we need to, to provide produce these um, kind of catchment wide projects, really. Um, we can find out all sorts of things by the presence or absence of particular species within a catchment. Uh, for example, if we discover that um, a species is found um, downstream of a weir or at the confluence of say the Avon and the Chew, but it's not being found a couple of hundred meters upstream, then we need to look into the reasons for that. So perhaps there's a, um, a man-made barrier in the way, such as a weir, um, that's preventing movement or migration up and down a river. Um, and therefore, then we can target what work needs to be done. Is it a problem with a barrier or is it something to do with the habitat that's being found upstream? Is it not good quality habitat? Is the water quality an issue upstream instead? Um, and it provides that evidence base to then be able to explore it further um, and then deliver that wide sort of array of river restoration that um, we do at BART. So I know you were doing something pretty exciting earlier today. Um, you were delivering baby eels to schools. Was, yeah, not not just the kind of standard Tuesday morning. Um, I know. Although it, increasingly... It like Tuesday morning by a long shot, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> so yeah. what, on, what on earth are we doing? Essentially, you're swapping the classic classroom experiment where you have tadpoles and you learn about the life cycle of a frog for the life cycle of, for the life cycle of eels. This is yeah. really, really cool. I wouldn't like to um, you know, fav make favourites um, in, in, in our rivers, but eels have got to be up there. 
um, to me, a little bit more exciting than a tadpole. Um, but anyway, yeah, so kind of alongside the exciting restoration work that we do deliver at BART, um, we also deliver a, a wide range of education and engagement projects as well. Um, and one of our projects that we're really pleased to be running this year, um, which looked increasingly unlikely um, because of the kind of current situation, but we've managed to, to get it into our classrooms, um, is our project called Eels in the Classroom. Um, and as you said, I actually collected the young eel elvers or glass eels this morning. Um, and they're being introduced into tanks in three schools in the Chew Valley um, as we speak, basically. So there are eels um, entering classrooms as we speak. Um, and the idea behind this is that um, we kind of bring school children closer to nature by bringing nature into the classroom um, and doing this through a, an exciting project. So European eels are critically endangered. Um, and while they're in the care of the school, the pupils will learn all about the reasons for this um, and find out all about their river environments. Um, and with the overall aim really of, of inspiring the next generation of river guardians, um, which is really exciting. So. At the end of the project, once the eels are a little bit bigger um, and they've been fed uh, by the pupils and learnt all about, they'll then be re released into the local river. Um, so probably on the on the River Chew and the Congressbury Yo, um, both in South Bristol, um, and they'll be released there to continue their um, journey and also to sort of boost the, the populations of a critically endangered species in our local rivers as well. How will you go about measuring that potential population increase? Um, I think it's quite difficult to do on a on the kind of small scale that we're doing it through this education project. Um, so, you know, the schools look after about 50 to 100 eels at a time, which seems like a lot. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, probably isn't that big. But mm -hmm. hopefully those eels will, will grow even bigger in the river, migrate back out to sea, um, ready to start their, you know, new life or the, the, the next stage of their life cycle as well. Um, but it will go back to our types of monitoring, you know, through electrofishing or eDNA sampling. Um, and that's how we can when, you know, identify whether there are still populations there or if populations are increasing in the future. So, um, yeah, it does feed into that. Yeah, I think it's a really cool project. And unfortunately, I'm going to be thinking about eels every time I go wild swimming. So in some ways, I kind of wish you hadn't told me, but there we go. <laughs> um, oh, there's so much, so much cuter than you think. Um, I'll take your yeah. word for it. I'll take your word for it. Um, but listen, we can't we can't talk about nature restoration really without addressing the giant elephant in the room, can we? Climate change. Let's talk climate change and rivers. You know, how is our changing climate linking into all the conversations that we've got about rivers and river restoration? Yeah, I mean, climate change and our rivers are, are very closely linked. Um, there are the more sort of obvious consequences of climate change on quantity of water in our rivers and streams, particularly you know, in the summer when, when you'd expect lower river levels. But climate change is, is only going to exacerbate that and um, really impact river levels, not just through decreasing them, but also through um, you know, more frequent flooding events. Um, and the unpredictability of these weather events um, can have a huge impact on the aquatic wildlife um, which has, I suppose, evolved and adapted to really specific environmental conditions. So where you're having those extreme weather conditions and those, those um, yeah, more frequent extremes in the future, um, the wildlife is, is going to struggle to cope with it, um, essentially. Um, and then away from the more obvious kind of impacts on climate change, I suppose uh, impacts on water quality as well in our rivers, um, and more extreme river uh, or more extreme weather events such as heavy rainfall can overwhelm our urban environments. Um, they can flood our roads um, and lead to more regular discharges of raw sewage, which it comes back to into our rivers, um, so that our sewage systems can cope with it. Um, again, as surface water rushes through our towns through sort of those increased rainfall events, it carries with it all sorts of contaminants such as. Um, engine oils, garden fer uh, fertilizers, um, and cleaning products as well. You know all those things that potentially get um, you know left or poured down the drain and things like that um, can pollute our sensitive environment. So, yeah, I, I think climate change just 
further enhances the importance of our of our freshwater environments, um, which are crucial for the resilience of our own communities, um, and which will only become more dependent on um, in the future for water and for food. Um, so they're very closely linked, and um, yeah, we need to make sure we've got resilient resilient waterways and resilient rivers um, for all of our sakes, really. Oh, definitely. Well, okay, well, talking then a little bit about resilience and sustainability and things, and, and you know, responsible water use is quite a big issue as well these days, particularly, as you said, as we face much more likelihood of increased extreme weather events, flooding and drought and things. And yeah. Bristol, obviously, we all know about the River Avon, but you also work on the Bristol Froom and the Bristol Avon Rivers Trust. You have a really cool water use, kind of water saving sustainability project going on with some communities down there, don't you? So can you talk a little bit about your work on the Bristol Froom? Yeah, for sure. So so the Bristol Froom um, flows from South Gloucestershire um, down into, um, into the Avon in Bristol. Um, so some rural and urban environments that it flows through. Um, and linking to your previous con question about climate change, um, we're leading this project on the Bristol Froom to raise awareness of the river um, and the issues that it faces, particularly in light of a changing climate. Um, and we want to work with the local communities to, to show them how they can help care for the river, essentially, in this changing climate. Um, so the first step of that really is, is delivering an education programme in local schools, um, teaching pupils all about the Bristol Froom and its wildlife, um, and introducing the topics of water quality um, and water saving at home so that they can, can get, go home and, and use their, their own water saving tips as well. Um, to help local residents uh, make their own differences to water quality and to help the communities become more resilient to more regular extremes in weather. Um, we've been delivering leaflets um, all about our work and about things that people can do at home to save water, um, including by offering free water butts um, to those homes as well in the target areas close to the Froom. Um, and these provide an opportunity to harvest rainwater um, for their own use um, and also to slow the flow of wa surface water through these urban areas, um, ultimately to help the Bristol Froom and the wildlife that lives there as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, these kind of projects are really important element of our work um, and they also help to connect communities with their natural environments um, or, or their local natural environments uh, while also enabling them to, to take their own kind of action on the mm. issues they care about which is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. I think being able to empower people to feel as though they can make a change and make an impact on some of these bigger questions and bigger problems. Mm -hmm. It's so important for ensuring that actually collectively as a community, we are able to do something about protecting all the spaces that we love and care about. So no, I think that's a really, really interesting project. It's brilliant. But um, there are other ways, aren't there, that Bristol and Bath residents uh, can get involved in your work. You've got mm. a really, really fun initiative, which I, I love and I got involved in last year called Water Blitz. And it's, it's basically a citizen science project, isn't it? So tell us a little bit more about that and explain how anyone watching can get involved this year. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really, really pleased to be running our annual citizen science event, um, which is the Bristol Avon Water Blitz. Um, which will be taking place on, well, between the 9th and the 12th of July. So that's a Friday to Monday. And it's a, a blitz of, um, of water sampling, essentially. Um, so the event is run in partnership with Earthwatch. And it needs members of the public, anyone living within the Bristol Avon catchment. Um, and you can see on our website the map of the catchment in case you're not sure uh, where you sit within that. Um, but it requires members of the public to be river guardians and gather data on water quality in our rivers um, and our streams and our ponds and our lakes, all of our freshwater environments. Um, so what we need participants to do is to sign up and receive their free water sampling kit in the post or at one of our local events during the weekend. Um, and when they've received their kit, they'll be able to take water samples from their chosen sites um, using this kit to gather information on the levels of nutrients found in that water sample. Um, I'll probably make it sound more complicated than it is, but I promise it's really straightforward. <laughs> and, and the data um, that uh, citizen scientists will collect is really important to help us gain a snapshot of water quality across our catchment. 
So the things that they'll be testing for um, are nutrients, as I said, so phosphates and nitrates, which are naturally occurring compounds um, in water or in, in our river environments. Um, but when they're found in high concentrations, they can cause real problems for um, kind of local wildlife as well. They can cause all sorts of things like eutrophication and algal blooms that are, can be quite devastating to, to freshwater populations. Um, and by building this kind of map of water quality, the results from water blitz will help BART identify um, locations for kind of more in-depth testing and also to help us target our future conservation work. Um, so it's a really important one and it's such a brilliant way for people to get involved um, and to connect to their local or their favourite stream or their newly discovered stream as well that perhaps they've discovered during lockdown. So it's another chance to just get outside and um, make a real difference to your local um, environment. Yeah, uh, and as you said, it's it's really easy and it's really fun and mm -hmm. it's really engaging. It's It couldn't be easier to get involved. It's definitely something worth doing if you care about your local rivers. Yeah, definitely. So if you do want to get involved, it, it's really easy to register. Um, the best way to do that is to head to the BART website. So we're at bristolavenriverstrust.org forward slash events, where you'll find information about um, signing up for Water Blitz. Um, and there's also, really excitingly, um, we've got a new like Water Blitz data explorer, which um, allows you to explore all the data from previous years. Um, you can look at how your local water course has fared in the past um, and help you identify where there are gaps in the data ready for this summer's event as well. Um, so on that note, you can head to bristolavenriverstrust.org forward slash water blitz um, and you'll find our really cool um, data explorer as well um, and get exploring on that one. But yeah, hopefully we'll get lots of people involved and it'll make a real difference um, to our river environments. Brilliant. And OK, finally, then, before we wrap up, once everyone has signed up for Water Blitz, of course, how else can people get involved in your wider work and find out a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd recommend heading to our website um, where all the information is there. Um, but there's loads of opportunities to, to volunteer with BART. Um, we lead um, loads of tree planting projects, in-stream river restoration as well, which people can get involved in um, when our projects need volunteers. Um, you could become a Riverfly monitor, um, a, a Riverfly monitoring volunteer, um, where you can take monthly samples of the invertebrates in your local stream, which is really important for identifying pollution events as well. Um, there's all sorts of ways that you can get involved in our work as well. If you, you work for a, a team that are keen to um, deliver some corporate days as well, you can get involved in those. Um, so yeah, but head to our website to, to find out more basically. But I think um, take part in Water Blitz as a first step um, and then go from there. Definitely, I'm certainly going to be getting involved again. So um, thank you so much, George. That's absolutely fascinating. I've learned a lot about the river, which I spend quite a lot of time on and didn't necessarily know a huge amount about. So thank you so much and best of luck with Water Blitz this year. Thank you very much. Cheers, Emma. No problem. Bye-bye.